welcome to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine PRN Journal Club presentation. I'm your host, Christian Kroll, an emergency medicine and ICU pharmacist at the University of Iowa Hospital and Clinics. To view this recorded presentation, head to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at ACCP PRN. And for PRN members, slides can be found under the library entry section of the ACCP community's website. My name is Deja. I am a PGY2 emergency medicine pharmacy resident at the Medical University of South Carolina. Today we'll be talking about those comparisons for IV dexamethasone, specifically for patients who have moderate to severe migraines. So just to get started with some background, migraine is a common disabling primary headache disorder that can occur with or without aura. Essentially for a patient to be diagnosed with a migraine, there is set criteria. So this is from the International Headache Society that essentially defines a migraine as a headache that lasts four to 72 hours, either untreated or unsuccessfully treated. It has to have at least two of the following qualities. So either unilateral location, pulsating quality defined as moderate or severe pain intensity, and it has to cause some type of aggravation by or cause avoidance of um, some type of routine physical activity. So walking, washing clothes, like activities of daily life, essentially. During the headache, one of the following must be present. So either nausea and or vomiting or photophobia and phonophobia. And then it must not be accounted for any other headache society diagnosis criteria. So a patient with a migraine must have at least five attacks that fulfills that criteria that we just discussed in order for them to be diagnosed with a migraine. In terms of epidemiology, so migraines are fairly common. They account for more than 1 million ED visits in the United States, specifically for patients having acute migraine attacks. It is ranked the third most prevalent disorder in the world by the global burden of disease, and that's back in 2010. It does occur more commonly in your younger adults with a peak prevalence between ages 30 and 49, and it has been shown to decrease in prevalence as age increases. And it also causes a significant cost burden for our health system, so estimated at about $700 million per year. In terms of treatment options, there are a variety of treatment options for patients who present with migraine. Some are going to be more nonspecific. So earlier on, if patients have mild um, complaints, they may start with NSAIDs, acetaminophen, aspirin, or a combination of those. Then you progress more to your tryptans, which are your primary abortive agents. You have your dihydrocardamines. Certain antiemetics can be used. Magnesium has been shown as well as dexamethasone. And then your more targeted therapy with some of your newer agents, so your CGRPs, which are your calcitonin gene-related peptide receptor antagonists, have also been kind of implemented and are now used for migraine treatment as well. To highlight two of the agents that will be discussed throughout the trial, we will talk about today. The first is going to be metoclopramide. So in terms of migraine therapy, metoclopramide is more used for symptom management, so to alleviate the pain and nausea that's associated with headaches. Mechanistically, it does antagonize at the dopamine receptor, and it also provides some agonism at the peripheral muscarinic receptor as well, and also having those antiemetic effects. Traditionally, we dose metoclopramide at 10 milligrams but there have been doses up to 20 milligrams that have been studied throughout the trial. So it kind of just depends. But for the most part, we'll start patients with 10 milligram. Metoclopramide can have a variety of adverse effects, which does include CNS depression, which can be seen just through some like increased drowsiness, ultimate status if it progresses too far. Patients can have dystonia, metallic taste is a complaint of some of your oral formulations, and it can cause achabesia as well. But pretreatment with diphenhydramine or your Benadryl has been shown to mitigate that achabesia. In terms of literature, one trial done by Tech and colleagues back in 1990 showed that metoclopramide was superior to placebo in terms of headache relief at one hour. And then a newer trial in 2006 showed that metoclopramide 10 milligrams IV was superior to 6 milligrams subcutaneous sumatriptan, specifically for headache relief at 15 minutes. Our next agent is going to be dexamethasone. So in contrast to metoclopramide, dexamethasone and its role in therapy focus more on reducing the incidence of migraine recurrence. The exact mechanism is not known, but the thought is that whenever a patient has a migraine, there's a a vasal or release of a vasoactive neuropleptide, which causes an overall inflammatory response. So the use of dexamethasone is thought to kind of blunt this inflammatory response that occurs and really just mitigate um, kind of the recurrence of further migraines. 
there have been several doses that were studied um, anywhere from four to 24 milligrams utilized in combination with your standard migraine abortive therapy. And then dexamethasone also has associated side effects of dizziness, nausea, vomiting, swelling in some cases. Patients can have some glucose dysregulation as well as perineal paritis. For dexamethasone, I'm going to highlight four trials. So the first is going to be by Friedman and colleagues in 2007. So this one was a prospective double-blind randomized control trial in 205 patients that essentially compared metoclopramide, 20 milligrams IV with Benadryl, 25 milligrams IV, and then they compared dexamethasone, 10 milligrams IV to placebo. This trial essentially found that there was no significant difference in pain-free outcomes or functional impairment in terms of ED discharge, but did find that dexamethasone more than placebo, not significant, but was more associated with a pain-free outcome for migraine, specifically for patients who had a migraine duration of greater than 72 hours. So overall, this trial concluded that IV dexamethasone should not be routinely used for acute migraine, but it may be useful for patients who have had a migraine that was longer than 72 hours. In 2008, Coleman and colleagues did a meta-analysis looking at seven studies, so a total of 738 patients. And all of these studies essentially compared IV dexamethasone to either placebo or some other standard of care. They found that dexamethasone and placebo, for the most part, provided similar acute pain reduction, but the dexamethasone was more effective in reducing recurrence rates. They concluded that IV dexamethasone plus an abortive therapy provided a relative reduction of about 26% in terms of headache recurrence with a number needed to treat of nine. In 2012, there was an additional prospective double-blind randomized control trial completed in 90 patients, this time evaluating propofol and dexamethasone. The propofol was dosed at 10 milligrams every five to 10 minutes up to a max of 80. And in this trial, they looked at a weight-based dose up to 16 milligrams. This trial found that the mean pain score was lower in the propofol group and propofol also showed a faster reduction of the headache. So concluding that propofol was safe and effective treatment for patients who presented to the ED with migraine. Our last trial was done in 2013. Again, another prospective randomized trial, this time looking at 31 patients comparing 16 milligrams of IV dexamethasone to valproic acid, 900 milligrams. They found no significant difference in improvement in terms of pain scores or headache relapse and concluded that valproic acid was similar in efficacy to IV dexamethasone. So essentially, these are not all the trials that are available for IV dexamethasone kind of within this migraine patient population, but this does kind of provide an overall point of like the landscape of trials that we do have available. So there have been several trials to support the use of dexamethasone for acute pain relief, more trials kind of providing the details of like the more niche population with prevention of headache recurrence. And then there have been some trials that have shown that dexamethasone may not be that beneficial for these patients. As you can kind of see throughout, there were a variety of different like, dosages evaluated for dexamethasone. So that, again, brought forth the question of what may be the optimal dose for these patients, which is essentially what we're going to evaluate today. Overall, in terms of recommendation, so this is, again, from the American Headache Society. They made no recommendation for patients regarding the role of parenteral dexamethasone for acute migraine relief in adults who present to the emergency department. But they do state that parenteral dexamethasone should be offered to adults who present to the ED with an acute migraine to prevent recurrence of headaches. They also state that IV metoclopramide should be offered to adults who present to the ED with an acute migraine as well. So in terms of this trial specifically, so this was a randomized trial. As I mentioned, we're comparing low versus high IV dexamethasone, specifically for patients who have moderate to severe migraine. And this was just conducted in August of 2023. So this is a randomized double-blind comparative efficacy study, and they essentially sought out to determine if a higher dose IV dexamethasone, so 16 milligrams, provided more relief for patients in the ED with migraine compared to your lower dose of 4 milligram dexamethasone when given with metacropamide 2 milligrams IV. So they included patients who categorized their headache pain as being moderate or severe, and they utilize a modified International Headache Society 3 migraine criteria, so the without or criteria, similar to what we reviewed earlier. But in this case, they only require patients to have one experience that was similar previously in contrast to the five that is required for the full criteria that we discussed. In addition, patients could have a headache duration that was more than 72 hours. And they did include patients with a headache that met all the criteria without migraine of aura, except for item E. So in the previous discussion, we discussed that patients, if they have 
a headache that is accounted by any other diagnosis, then they technically wouldn't fit the migraine criteria. But in this case, they did also include patients who had other criteria for diagnosis if it was migraine with aura. So essentially including patients with and without aura in this trial. Patients were excluded if they had any suspicion for secondary headaches. So any headache brought on by something else, essentially. So this included fever or focal neurologic findings on the physical exam. They also excluded any patients who were already using corticosteroids, if they were pregnant or breastfeeding or had any contraindications or allergies to the study medications that were being evaluated. So as mentioned for this trial, all of the patients received metoclopramide 10 milligrams IV, and then they were randomized into two groups to either receive dexamethasone 4 milligrams IV or dexamethasone 16 milligrams IV. For primary outcomes, this trial evaluated a sustained headache relief for 48 hours, so this was defined as patients who achieved headache relief, which they defined as a patient categorizing their pain as no pain at all or the pain being mild, or the intensity being mild. So they had to achieve the headache relief within two hours and then maintain it without the requirement of any additional medication for the 48 hour follow up period. For secondary outcomes, they again looked at headache relief within two hours. So as I mentioned, these are the patients who achieved headache relief, so either no pain or a mild pain intensity within two hours. They also looked at patients who um, or evaluated the number of headache days that occurred during the subsequent week after ED discharge. They utilized a survey-based questionnaire to evaluate if patients would have a preference for the same medication if they presented to the ED again for a similar experience. And then they also evaluated the use of any additional medication that was required in the ED or after discharge. So for follow-up, they did assess patients via telephone at 48 hours and seven days after the ED visit to kind of evaluate these outcomes. In terms of statistics, they did design this trial to detect a 15% absolute difference. Assuming a primary outcome of 30% in the high-dose group and 45% in the low-dose group, they did anticipate the need for 163 patients per group. And that would provide an alpha of 0.05 and a beta of 0.2 to account for a 10% margin of error. So for any violations or losses of follow-up, they did anticipate the need for 360 patients total, so about 180 in each group. After 200 patients were enrolled, they did conduct an interim analysis just to evaluate at that time if there were any changes that were thought to be or any differences that could be highlighted between the two groups and decide if there was any need to discontinue the trial earlier. They also conducted multivariable regression models that were utilized to evaluate any discrepancies or evaluate any changes within the baseline variables. So for this trial, there were a little over 1,800 patients that were screened for enrollment. They did exclude a little over 1,600 patients based on the exclusion criteria that we discussed. 209 patients were randomized and allocated to the 4 milligram and 16 milligram groups. This trial did end early. So at their interim analysis, they did continue the trial early for futility. So a little, they did not meet the anticipated number of patients per group that they needed to kind of meet their power. Four patients were lost for follow-up to each group in each group. And there were several patients excluded from analysis. So overall, 100 patient, 102 patients were evaluated for analysis of that primary outcome in both of the groups. In terms of baseline characteristics, they were fairly matched between the two groups that were evaluated. In terms of sex, there was a higher female population. There were more female patients in the four milligram group than those in the 16 milligram group, but female representation was the majority in both. In terms of headaches intensity, most patients categorized their headache as being severe, so 70% or higher for both of the groups that were evaluated. And then 60 or 60% 60 or more patients in each group did identify that they took some type of migraine treatment before they presented to the ED. So here is a detailed list of the medications that were used prior to ED presentation. As you can see here, NSAIDs and acetaminophen do represent the majority of the medications that were ingested prior to presentation, but patients did endorse use of other OTC migraine combinations, um, barbiturates, opioids, tryptans, and even your more targeted CRGP antagonists as well. In terms of results for this trial, so first looking at this primary, our primary outcome of sustained headache relief for 40 hours, it was did show a higher percentage in the 16 milligram group, but there was not a significant difference between the two groups that were evaluated. 
Similarly, for each of our secondary outcomes, there was not a significant difference between the four milligram or 16 milligram groups. In terms of additional results, to highlight 78% of the dexamethasone patients in the four milligram group and 81% in the 16 milligram group did state on their questionnaires that they would want to receive the same treatment if they had to present to the ED for another visit. And there were several patients in both groups, so 20% in four milligram and then 17% in the 16 milligram that required some type of rescue medication to provide headache relief either in the ED or after. For this trial, they also evaluated a specific population of patients who had a headache duration for more than 72 hours to essentially identify if there was any benefit to the doses in that patient population specifically. Again, as you can see highlighted here, for our primary outcome of sustained headache relief at 48 hours, there was not a significant difference between the groups. Similarly, with your headache relief at two hours, there was not a difference and in terms of number of days of headache post-discharge, um, so within the week after, it was fairly similar. So no significant difference, but with three days as a median in the four milligram group, and then two days as a median in the 16 milligram group. And in terms of those multivariate regression models that I mentioned earlier, when controlling for nausea, duration of headache, or gender, they did not identify any significant difference between either of the groups in terms of a benefit with one, the lower dose or the higher dose. Lastly, um, I wanted to highlight the adverse events. So these were also not significantly different between the two groups, a little under or a little over 20 percent for both of the groups in terms of any event that were that did occur. But overall, the percentages were less than 10 percent for all of the other adverse events that were highlighted. In conclusion, these authors essentially concluded that when added to 10 milligrams IV metoclopramide, Doses of dexamethasone that were greater than four milligrams are unlikely to benefit patients in the ED with a migraine. In terms of my study critique, so for strengths, I would just highlight the study design. So having this uh, double blind criteria, of course, eliminates any potential bias, making sure that the metoclopramide was administered um, over 15 minutes in both groups and that the patients were appropriately randomized utilizing block randomization and to the two groups further just supported this strength of study design. In terms of limitations, I think there are a few to highlight. So first, a potential compound effect for patients receiving multiple agents prior to the study drug or dose. So as I mentioned, there were several patients who received some of your more nonspecific agents, so aspirin, Tylenol, NSAIDs, but some patients even received your more targeted like CRGP antagonists. There was not any information provided in terms of how much sooner the patients received these agents. So I definitely think that there could be a potential for a compound effect in patients who may have ingested any of these medications right before ED presentation. So maybe some of their headache relief was more so provided by the compound effect of more one agent or more instead of just comparing the doses of our agents. Our next limitation would just be, uh, as I mentioned, the study ended early due to fertility. So this trial was, did not meet the intended patients to reach the power that they highlighted in their statistics se section. So that would just be something to keep in mind that overall, although they didn't find a significant difference anyway, the results really wouldn't be able to kind of highlight if there was a true difference between the uh, groups that we were evaluating. The next limitation would be generalizability, and I think this incorporates a few things. So first, in terms of location, this was conducted at two Bronx, New York's hospitals. So it would be difficult to generalize these results or extrapolate these results to a hospital um, population that may be different from this study population. In addition to that, I think if there were any differences in like migraine phenotype or if patients received any other type of abortive therapy outside of metoclopramide or in patients who received any other therapy outside of IV dexamethasone, so if they received an oral corticosteroid or the use of another agent, then I think that it would be difficult to extrapolate these results to those patient populations. And then lastly, there was no placebo group in this trial. Kind of given the low, and the authors also mentioned this, like given the low benefit of the agents overall, so like in both groups, nearly two-thirds of the patients in both of these groups did not receive headache relief. So I think it would have been beneficial to kind of see a placebo group as well, just to identify this was the patient population overall, or if this is true representation of the differences in these dexamethasone doses, because it's also possibly potential or a potential possibility that these patients may not have received any benefit, whether they got dexamethasone or nothing at all. So just the metoclopramide by itself. 
In terms of my conclusions, I think overall this trial failed to demonstrate a benefit over the higher doses of dexamethasone in comparison to the low dose, specifically for patients with acute migraines in the ED. I don't think that this trial added any more value in terms of helping clarify the optimal dose for dexamethasone. It did suggest that our higher doses may not be necessary to provide any sort of relief. As I mentioned, I would caution extrapolation of these results to patients who have other migraine phenotypes or those that are receiving different abortive therapies. And then lastly, although dexamethasone has been studied a great deal in terms of migraine population, I do think that additional trials will be needed comparing varying doses and also incorporating some type of placebo arm to further help identify if there were any optimal or if there is an optimal dexamethasone dose. And I'll take any questions. If you have enjoyed this presentation content and would like to hear more, subscribe via your favorite podcasting app. Additionally, make sure to check out our YouTube page for all recorded presentations. Thank you for listening to this week's ACCP Emergency Medicine Journal Club presentation. Join us weekly for review and discussion of new journal articles in emergency medicine. This podcast provides general information only and does not offer individualized medical or professional health care services, including pharmaceutical advice. The contents and materials in the podcast are not intended to be a substitute for inpatient pharmaceutical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And the use of the contents and materials in the podcast does not constitute a pharmacist-patient relationship. As a result, the information in and materials linked to this podcast are applied at the user or patient's own risk. Users or patients should consult their physician or personal health care professional. The user or patient should not ignore or delay seeking care because of something they heard on this podcast. In case of an emergency, the user or patient should contact their physician, call 911, or go to the nearest medical emergency facility. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are those of the host and guest. It should not be interpreted to reflect the official position or policy of ACCP or the Emergency Medicine PRN.